Completing a Stuart Triple Expansion Engine. This one's part 48, the day after my prostate transperineal biopsy, and I am already back in the workshop. I will tell of my experiences during the video. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. I'd like to show you this modification to the eccentric sheaves. On this engine, the eccentric sheaves are made as a pair, and in this clip, you can see the original grub screw fitting which is the way Stuart normally connect eccentric sheaves to crankshafts. This method is extremely weak, and thankfully this eccentric pair have been modified. But first, my experiences having a transperineal biopsy in York Hospital yesterday. This procedure was carried out by a very experienced surgeon, whose name is Mr Cass, and believe it or not, Mr Cass has his own YouTube channel called Cass Urology Online. If you want to see specifically my procedure, there is a YouTube link to my particular video at the beginning, in the text. I really was worried about this, but there was nothing to worry about in the end. I had it done under a local anaesthetic. I didn't see the point of being rendered unconscious, and the anaesthetist recommended that I went for another method, which was intravenous sedation. This did not agree with my brain at all. Instead, I asked for it to be disconnected and said, I'll just go with a local anaesthetic, thank you. Now you think I'm going to say, it was really painful, but in fact it wasn't painful at all. The skill of Dr. Cass can be seen in the video link, and it was nothing like Vlad the Impaler's method. Anyway, that's enough of that. All I can say, gentlemen, if you're watching this, always get your prostate checked out. If you have any issues, it's better to sort it earlier rather than later. Whilst talking about the transperineal biopsy, I'm making an airline union because shortly I want to try and run this engine using compressed air. I have to say this is the first attempt at making anything on this small Warco WM180 lathe, which is sat on foam pads, that's why it's moving about. I'm also using the wrong lathe tool because I haven't had time to fit some others to the other holders. I'll do that later this week. I parted off this component by changing the position of the tool post as I've just shown. Now the tool post is back to normal and I'm cleaning up the end. This was a very simple job and even with the wrong tool in the tool post, this Warco lathe coped with it beautifully. Here I'm machining a shoulder on the part so the silicone rubber pipe will fit up to this part of the fitting. With the component finished, this clip shows me fitting it in place on the high pressure steam chest. I know there's some swarf in the end of it, but I will clean that out in the fullness of time. Here I'm fitting the silicone rubber tubing using a spring clip, and hopefully this should hold it tightly in place on the fitting. But no, I turned the pressure up too high and the pipe blew off, and this is why I always wear eye protection. The reason I turned up the air pressure too high was because the engine didn't even try to start. That is because the valve timing of the high pressure cylinder and the low pressure cylinder is incorrect. As far as I am aware, the valve timing of the centre cylinder should be OK, as I made a jig to set that up. The next thing to look at is the operating lever for the air pump. There are some issues with this lever, more about that shortly. The first thing to do is to drill the centre of it 964 of an inch, which is clearance size for 4BA. This part is made from gun metal, not brass, and you can see that by the way the chippings come off it. Here it is, fitted to the air pump. There's an immediate problem. It cannot work because part of the bracket fouls the air pump. I mark the point of impact with a felt tip pen. This is where I need to reshape the operating arm so that it doesn't collide with the pump. Using a felt tip pen, I mark the area that needs to be removed. As I'm not in the main workshop, I can't use my belt sanders, so I thought I would try this, which was completely ineffective. A viewer kindly mentioned how dangerous these small grinders could be, and I would agree. I always wear eye protection, and I generally run these slower than they're supposed to be run at. This is a Dremel quick-release cutting disc. They're very good. Unlike this, which is a Dremel quick-release drum sander, and it will not stay where I put it. I can, however, work with this by pressing the operating arm in a downward motion. This appears to keep the sanding drum in position. This is how it works, and it does appear to be quite a clever idea. 
but unfortunately it doesn't hold the sanding drums as securely as the block of rubber type. I had to keep stopping because this part was getting quite hot, and as I've mentioned a million times, I never wear gloves in the workshop, because I would like to know where all of my fingers are at any given time. After shaping the operating arm, it's time to fit it back to the crosshead. This is looking much better, although it is different to the other one. I think this is OK. The operating arm of the water pump does need to be quite a bit stronger than the vacuum pump arm. There is, however, a problem. In the down position, the piston inside the vacuum pump is hitting the bottom of the casting. And by the bottom of the casting, I mean the casting which is the bed plate casting. This pump was made by Mr Ronnie Maul, a very experienced engineer, and the pump is built exactly to the drawing. When the nut is screwed onto the piston rod shaft, it is extremely close to the two nuts that hold the valve gland cover in place. To allow more movement on the piston rod, I'm going to machine the end of the piston inside the pump. I thought I would take this opportunity to reshape the end of the operating arm for the air pump. Just like the hexagon nut, this didn't fully clear the nuts that hold the gland in place. To gently reshape this, I used the rotary grinder. This job could be very easily spoilt, so I'm taking great care not to spoil it. I'm hardly applying any pressure to the cutting disc, and it's cleaning up the end of the operating arm fine. These quick release cutters are very good. In this clip, you can see that there is some allowance for side movement. But never do jobs like this without using suitable eye protection. With the cutting disc back in the box in the drawer, it's time to finish the job with some wet to dry sandpaper. Now it's time to fit the operating arm back in place on the crosshead. For this, as previously shown, I'm using my long, thin socket. I'm tightening the socket using an Allen key through the hole in the screwdriver handle. I shouldn't need to mention this, but it's very important never to apply too much pressure to these very small nuts and bolts on miniature steam engines, or they will break. This clip shows the operating arm is still fouling at the bottom of its stroke. That's because the nut is not tightened fully down. When I tighten the bottom nut as far down as it will go, as you can see in this clip, there is no pressure being put on the operating arm at the bottom of its stroke now. What I need to do next is have a look at the tolerance when the operating arm is pulling the piston right to the top of the stroke. That's it for this episode. I'm still recovering from the transperineal biopsy. In the meantime, if you want to see what happened to me yesterday, and don't worry, it's not in colour, just type the text on screen into YouTube. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.